sex ed curriculum in Idaho. We actually have a law <laughs> that says in Idaho that sex ed curriculum has to be family orientated yeah. and encouraging towards life. But what is a family? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we uh, also have problems in Idaho defining that too. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Thursday evening. Thank you for joining us. Pastor Toby Chuck Knox. I'm the water boy. It's good to be with you on Cross Politics. He doesn't, like say, open. He doesn't say good evening. He just says Thursday evening. <laughs> Thursday <laughs> evening. Hey, by joining the Fight, Laugh, Feast Army, not only will you be aiding in our fight to take down secular and legacy media, but you'll also get access to content placed in our club portal, such as past shows, all our conference talks, and exclusive content for club members that you won't be able to find anywhere else. Lastly, you also get discounts at our conferences. Don't forget, man, $100 off. Register today. Go to become a member, and also, of course, if you can't make it to the conference, yes, you can watch the conference live as stream. a club member. If yeah. you're a club member. So go to fightlaughfeast.com. Don't miss a minute. I'm drinking today. It's one of those kind of shows. What, what you drinking? Um, well, stuff that helps this. Um, <laughs> helps you digest this? Uh, no. Helps clear, yeah. clear the sinuses? Clear the palate to deal with the, what we had to deal with today. So it's, it's amazing to me all the culture wars that are, that are really starting to heat up. This is a okay. different kind of culture th- th- war. This mm. is a different kind of culture war. Sort of. Yes or no. Nothing's new under the sun. Like Aztecs. Uh, and and <laughs> Matt Walsh, who uh, Steve Dace tweeted out today, he's like, he thinks Matt Walsh should get journalists up the I year. think yeah. he's right. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. he's yeah. right. Absolutely. And Matt Give Walsh, them in the war. Uh, uh, and his team, his staff, kind of went into Vanderbilt Medical Facility yeah. and, and kind of uncovered some of these videos from 2018. I can't believe they're just now that Matt Walsh wow. is kind of the one who's, who's dug them up. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing what uh, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Clayton, this first video is from Dr. Taylor. Uh, um, and, and she convinced Nashville to start doing trans surgeries based off the money. Listen to this. January 1st of 2017, for it to be Affordable Care Act, insurance cover carriers are mandated to cover medical expenses for trans folks. Um, some of our BUMC financial folks in, 20, in August of 20, I'm sorry, October of 2016, starting a couple of years ago, put down some costs of how much money we think each patient would bring in. And this is only including top surgery. This isn't including any bottom surgery. And um, it's a lot of money. These surgeries make a lot of money. Um, so female to male chest reconstruction can bring in $40,000. Uh, a patient just on routine hormone treatment, who I'm only seeing a few times a year, can bring in several thousand dollars because that requires a lot of visits. And Drug that, bill. It actually makes money for the hospital. Makes now, money. these I got from the internet, um, but it's from uh, the Philadelphia Center for Transgender Surgery, which has um, does a lot of um, surgery for patients. And I just want to give you an idea of how much these bottom surgeries are making. And this is, I think this has to be an underestimate. Uh, this is for a vaginoplasty. They're saying they're quoting roughly around twenty thousand dollars for a vaginoplasty, but that doesn't include your hospital stay. That doesn't include your post-op visits. That doesn't include um, your anesthesia, your OR. So I would think that this has to be a gross underestimate. I think that's just like the surgeon's uh, piece of it, which anybody who's ever been in a hospital knows that that's like ten percent of it. Uh, and then the female to male bottom surgeries. These are huge money makers. Again, I think this has to be an underestimate that they're quoting around $20,000 for a phalloplasty. There's been different things that I've read that said it could be up to $100,000. Um, Dr. Lineker, who's our surgeon, says that there's entire clinics where the entire clinic is supported just by their phalloplasties, and that is like a fraction of the surgeries that they're doing. These surgeries are labor intensive. They require a lot of follow-ups. They require a lot of OR time. They make money. They make money for the hospital. So don't damn, miss this. Damn wow. the ethics. They damn the morality. They require a lot of follow up. Right. Right. A lot of follow up. Now listen to Doctor Clayton talk about. So this is you know if you have a conscientious or religious exemption uh, 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 objection, yeah, forget about it. If you are going to assert conscientious objection, you have to th- realize that that is problematic. You are doing something to another person, and you are not paying for the the cost for your belief. I think that is a real, I mean, I think that's a real issue. So, um, so I think, you know, so you're, so yes, Vanderbilt, if someone has a conscientious objection to uh, participating in this sort of surgery, 
it, it probably enough to accommodate you to the extent that you can find another person who can do your job, who doesn't have an objection, other things of that nature. But I just want you to take home that saying that you're not going to do something because of your conscientious, because of your religious beliefs is not without consequences. And, and it should not be without consequences. And I just want to put that out there. Oh. We are given enormous, if you don't want to do this kind of work, don't work at Vanderbilt. So if you're a doctor, you have a religious exemption, yeah. you will, a religious ob objection to this, uh, you will face consequences. Right. You will face consequences. Y'all want something to drink too? Yeah. Now, <laughs> I'm about to. Now, but here's the deal. You can't, they, they've they created, Vanderbilt University and, and follow, uh, surrounding organizations have created a whole culture of facilitating yeah. um, these trans medical uh, procedures. Listen, this this next clip is just blows my mind. They have a trans buddy group. Oh, no. That that uh, where it's a group of um, mostly ladies, or they all look like ladies to me. Well, we don't. Yeah. We, we don't know mm. uh, where they're just kind of helping representing the patients and the emergency room, and to keep negative attention out. Right. Vanderbilt University Medical Center. My name is Sean Riley, and I'm the program coordinator for Trans Buddy at the program for LGBTQ health at Vanderbilt University. TransBuddy provides trained peer advocates for transgender patients trained? who are coming for doctor's appointments or other healthcare related services. Whether you're looking for something that's related to medical transition, such as hormone therapy, or something completely unrelated, like breaking an arm or going to an ENT, we are here, here to help support any transgender patients that come through our doors. The TransBuddy program was organically created through the efforts of transgender people and continues to consistently be led by trans people in Middle Tennessee. The TransBuddy program is a one-of-a-kind in the nation, and institutions are looking to Vanderbilt to replicate and expand programs like ours. We're not seeking to find solutions often for people's problems. We're just seeking to be there and to accompany and to be a friendly face. Um, and to be a non-medical face in a, in a place where everybody coming in the room is going to be a healthcare provider and, and may be unsafe. Sometimes I'm there to be um, sort of uh, always observing kind of how hospital staff are um, interacting with wow. individuals. And again, you know, using correct pronouns or treating the individual That's enough. Respect. That's enough. Um, These, they said that this is all trans people. The, I don't. I don't know. By trans trans people. I think. I think there's. Yeah. I, I know it's led by trans people. I, I think. Yep. I think those are dudes. You, but you, how it, much do you want to bet during COVID that these this little buddy circle could go visit their patient in the oh, hospital room up, and dang. mom and dad could not visit you, their patient during you COVID? You better shut. How much you want to bet, <laughs> boy? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? All I could think about was the death escorts that at, at yep, abortion at clinics. Planned Parenthood. Right. Yep. With, right. With that bouncy music in the background. So I, I, we're rushing through these videos because I want to get to Idaho. Yeah. Okay. We got we got Anna Miller uh, and Scott Yuner coming on here in a right. minute uh, yeah. to talk about because Idaho's blown up now too. Right. Right. This last video I want to show you is, is um, uh, basically the age at which they're giving these starting hormones, starting surgeries at Vanderbilt. We can provide gender affirming hormones on an individual who is on a pubertal blocker, depending on whatever kind of blocker they've chosen or we have discussed with them, or they can present to us at a later stage of puberty and then we provide the gender affirming hormones. Previously, the Endocrine Society recommended to start these at age 16, but we all know that would be delayed puberty, right? Not 16 year olds don't start puberty. So more recently, they did update that to say as early as 14 for compelling reasons. So we have some individuals who have started gender affirming hormones at 13 or 14 to be more like their peers. Again, fertility preservation and consent are very important to discuss prior to any initiation of the But why not 12? 10, why not? That's where they're going. Don't, don't, we don't want you getting too deep into puberty. Boy, right. they're going to export this to everyone. Okay. All right. Mm. Uh, trigger warning. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> this is an ad. This actually. <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to read this. Uh, tr trigger warning. If you're not comfortable with God's mandate to fill and subdue the world through fruitful households headed by masculine men, press mute now. Mm. If you're hearing this, you know it's hard to find anyone who shares your convictions on marriage and culture, so it's hard to find anyone to marry. Dominion dating? <laughs> You always do that. <laughs> Dominion Dating. Oh, you missed it. Okay. It's solving that problem. They're the only dating site that vets users for their commitment to biblical gendered piety. Free beta open September. Join the marriage reformation at Dominion.dating. <laughs> it actually is. It's Dominion.dating. So the same people who are driving these things in Tennessee 
are also trying to do that here in Idaho through introducing pornography in sex education programs. With us now are Scott Yenner and Anna Miller to get to the bottom of this. Scott Yenner is a Washington fellow at the Claremont Institute Center of the American Way of Life. He's a fighter, too. Anna Miller is Education Policy Director at the Idaho Freedom Foundation Center for American Education. Scott, thank you for joining us. Anna, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Anna, you originally wrote an article for the Idaho Freedom Foundation back in September, September 13th, exposing the connection between Idaho's public schools and the partnership they have with Idaho's Department of Health and Welfare and Idaho Department of Health and Welfare's acquisition of sex education products, which apparently included training in pornography. Um, what in the where where did this begin? How did this begin? And and where are we today? Yeah, so this all starts with federal grants. Idaho has been accepting several different federal grants, known as PrEP and SRAE for short, um, over many years. And these grants fuel our sex education program. And they don't go to our state Department of Education. They don't go through school boards. They go through our Department of Health and Welfare. And then the that um, program is implemented through local public health districts. And these are regional agencies that parents largely have absolutely no idea of how children are learning in schools. Um, so the particular program that Idaho purchases is called Reducing the Risk. And it's purchased from a very radical group known as Education Training and Research. And they've been promoting what they would call queering the schools for around a decade. Mm. Um, and they also promote things like uh, normalizing the consumption of pornography. And what we found is that because the uh, Department of Health and Welfare is referring regional agencies to purchase curriculum and trainings mm. and materials from this group, that many of their very radical resources have trickled down to the local level. And so we're now seeing public health districts like the North Central Health District um, offering things like a cartoon porn and uh, referring kids places to get an abortion and masturbation surveys and mm. bizarre things like this in the curriculum. Uh, so that's that's what's going on. What, so, what specific schools has this, um, uh, you know, porn yeah. literacy made it to? So, you know, I wish I could answer that question, but this is one of the biggest problems is transparency. So the Department of Health and Welfare and the public health districts, they're not required to collect any data on how many students they serve every year, on how many schools they're in. They won't even tell you on their websites which schools they're in. They'll simply say, we're working with the schools in these counties. You know, if you look at some of their strategic plans, for example, the public health district serving my county and Boise County. Um, it says, you know, we're implementing this program in three of the four districts that we're serving, um, but it won't tell you how many schools, it won't tell me how many students. So this is a really big problem. And, you know, another problem on the transparency part is that parents are largely told, if they're told at all, that their child is going to be put in this program. They're told that it's an abstinence program <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> this program does not teach abstinence. It's certainly sold under that veil but it actually encourages sexual acts. It teaches kids about the five different types of sex. It's LGBTQ inclusive. So it's encouraged them to adopt all different types of sexualities. It has instruction on gender identity, on sexual orientation. And again, the resources that places like North Central Health, Dist Health District claim to promote under this program are showing kids things like cartoon pornography. So abstinence is an incredible misnomer and pretty laughable um, as a description for this program. But what parent would object to abstinence if that's what your school district told you that they were offering wow. your child? So, so this it's important to note here yeah. that this is a public education partnering with Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Right. And Idaho Department of Health and Welfare is contracting with these kind of sex ed curriculum yeah. Reducing to bring it into public school. RTR, yeah. How, how – I mean, remember the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare was driving all these COVID shutdowns here in Idaho. Right. Right. Same people. Same so, people. I mean, and I, I – um, noticed, I, I, I saw, I think, maybe the original article briefly, but then, of course, the Associated Press also ran a story uh, just a couple of days uh -huh. after your original article. The headline Sorry, is... The oh, no, we love okay. the baby. No, we love babies. We, we love the kids. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Idaho, he says hi. Yeah, good. <laughs> hey. hey. Um, the headline reads, Idaho isn't offering children porn literacy materials. This is Associated Press, September 16th. The claim, <laughs> the claim is the Idaho government is offering materials on porn literacy to students as young as eight years old. AP's assessment, false. And then, you know, they, and then they walk through there and, and say, this, is, this isn't true. You got fact-checked, Anna. 
<laughs> you must be doing something right. Yeah. Oh, man. So, you know, the AP fact checkers say it must be so, so it must be true. Right. So, um, no, let's go through a couple. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. There's a couple, you know, misrepresentations and falsehoods and just total evasions in that article. And the first and most obvious one is that reducing the risk is unequivocally endorsed and promoted by Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And Planned Parenthood itself has offered this curriculum in Idaho schools. They offered it between 2015 and 2019 in Caldwell, Idaho. And they could still be offering it in schools. And parents would have absolutely no idea. And they actually do this in schools all over the country. And they promote the curriculum on their own website. They love it. And they have helped write other um, ETR curriculums that are very radical. And again, they, they like this curriculum because it encourages sexual acts and their entire business model is built around abortion. So the more um, young women who are not stable, not part of a family who are getting pregnant and coming to them, that helps their business model. Um, so it's really a it's a pernicious thing that the media is coming up there. Um, but another thing that they are completely ignoring is the way that this gets into schools, which is through public health districts. Um, and because Idaho has had such a long partnership with BTR, all of their radical resources are starting to show up at the local level. And the AP article completely ignores this. They completely ignore that there are publicly available resources under um, North Central Health District's Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program, showing kids how to erase their browsing history, showing them where to get an abortion, uh, masturbation surveys, um, articles with titles like transgender men can get pregnant too, articles about <laughs> anal sex, um, articles about how to come out to skeptical parents as a trans student or a um, LGBT student, um, all sorts of things that if these resources were on a school district website, parents would notice and they would be outraged. Mm -hmm. But because they're on a public uh, health district website, parents just haven't noticed and it's flown under the radar. just want to point out that, again, everything that we're talking about here absolutely is training for what's going on at Vanderbilt. Yeah, that's I mean right. the the whole yeah. you know queer fluidity the you know the 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 LGBT I mean the, that's all part of the exact same push. Per perversion has a trajectory, absolutely, right? and so it doesn't right. stop in one particular place. Yeah, uh, you know, and I, I, so I was trying to. Um, track this i think what gabe said earlier about where what schools do we see with its curriculum showing up in and the truth is from what you said is that it sounds like this intentionally set up so that the shell game yeah it's a shell game that you can't find it and this seems really odd because you kind of want to put your finger and say see it's right here and ap's kind of saying well, you can't find it it's not there how do you account for it um in any kind of way outside of the fact that it's connected like three or four ways down the road how do you how do you bring it together to say, oh, it's here, all right? Well, there's a very clear trail from the federal grants that are coming into Idaho through the Departments of Health and Welfare to the public health districts and the payments that they are making to education, training, and research, and then the types of resources that are recommended by ETR on the public health district's website. Mm. And then they themselves claim to be offering this in schools. They just don't give us specific numbers or specific schools and things, but the trail is very obvious, and it's you know, it's sort of appalling that no journalist has taken the time to review this yeah. when all this information is publicly available. And let me tell you, the government is going to go to no length to cover this up, as well as the media. Um, you know, all of those resources I just talked about on the North Central Health District's website on um, the 15th of this month, they actually completely removed them just overnight. So you can go to the Wayback Machine and you can look at this page of all of these resources that are Ooh. very concerning that were on the website. They just disappeared poof, mm. overnight with no explanation. And the media hasn't even asked for an explanation for it. Of course mm. not. I just pulled up the website, uh, you know, etr.org. And right here, the, the, the first, first page says, watch our booster webinar to learn about revisions for medical accuracy, LGBTQ inclusiveness, trauma-informed approaches, et cetera. I mean, they're, it's, it's not, they're not hiding it that well. Scott, um, you're heavily yeah. involved in... Uh, conservative politics in Idaho. Um, I mean, is this a, a, a matter of, um, I mean, are we not nearly as conservative a state as we thought we were? <laughs> um, are we getting, are, are, or is this just, are, is this infiltrating our ranks? And if people knew what was going on, um, they would put a stop to this. What, what's your take? Well, I think there's two things to learn about this. First of all, uh, the reason Anna and I got interested in this is that we're interested in how the federal government uses uh, levers, money, incentives to uh, leverage change, uh, to fund the left and to achieve the left's goals in particular states. 
So mm. uh, we've looked at, for instance, how federal grants fund library radicalization. We've written articles about that in the national. Uh, others have written about, for instance, needle exchange programs, which are now you know, yeah. prevalent in a lot of cities. I know Moscow has one. Yep. And uh, Boise has one. And that's all funded not through health and welfare, but kind of with the aid of health and welfare. And uh, of, co of course, schools are another venue uh, where this happens. So Anna and I started looking at these national programs, which have these very innocuous names, you know, like the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program. I mean, in a sense, like who could oppose it? Right. So Idaho takes these grants and I think it's done, you know, on a naive basis. Um, it's not done with malicious intent uh, at our state level. Uh, the, the director of the Department of Health and Welfare thinks he's just funding pregnancy prevention programs. And uh, so the money comes. And then it's probably true, though, once again, it's not something that's easily traced, is that people within his bureaucracy here in Idaho, um, you know, like know what they can do with that money. Hmm. Uh, the standards for national sexuality, you know, curriculum are set by these interest groups. And then the grants come to Idaho and we don't say no to the $250,000 or a million dollars uh, for these things. And then, uh, you know, activist bureaucrats probably take them and leverage them where they can uh, toward these changes. So I don't think that the leadership, um, you know, is, is intentionally fostering these things. Uh, and I don't think that these grants are taken like knowing what we're getting. But a much more suspicious attitude or skeptical attitude um, must be had toward these federal grants because, like, whenever the word prevention is in their title, mm -hmm. there's some sort of large theory behind how you prevent things. Wow. And it ends up meaning you have to actually transform the world <laughs> in order to prevent adolescent uh, pregnancy. Um, and, uh, and, so, you know, what we're hoping that we can, uh, that uh, people can recognize the strings and, uh, and ideologies that are attached to these federal grants, and then I can just start saying no to them. And uh, I'm not saying that would solve all the problems, but if you dry up the well of money, then the interest groups then have to sustain themselves. And as it stands right now, the interest groups are sustained indirectly through these federal grants. So um, uh, one thing that Anna pointed out in her articles was that um, if there's going to be sex education in our classroom, it's actually regulated in Idaho. Yeah. Uh, and that there's a law in Idaho saying that sex education, if, if first of all, that it's they, they state the very first sentence that the primary responsibility for sex education is family uh, and church. They said that. Yeah. They said that multiple times in the uh, in the. <laughs> well, in go the, Idaho. And then they said the the public the, the school system is just kind of going to supplement and complement right. this. And then it kind of defines that if there's going to be sex education the curriculum in the public schools, it's got to be uh, the local school board has to say, yeah, we're going to do it or not. So right. it's a local decision, not a statewide decision, not a federal decision. And then they say it has to be family oriented about life and um, uh, helping uh, kids prepare to establish their own families. Yeah. So it's like a family-oriented sex education. It can't be it, based on reading this law. It can't be LGBT education. It can't be trans sex education. It can't be you know orgies, masturbation, and all this stuff. It just porn literacy, porn literacy, and all that stuff. Uh, uh, why is this even allowed in Idaho, given our uh, uh, the the uh, you know our parent law here that's in conflict? Yeah, well, let I'll, I'll let Anna speak to this in a second, but you know, just generally. I think this is another way in which, uh, you know, the leadership, uh, you know, uh, is behind the times on these matters that uh, we do not believe that the Department of Education in, in Idaho is pushing this stuff. This stuff is being pushed through the Department of Health and Welfare. Oh, man. And it's not going from the Department of Education to school districts. It's going from health and welfare to health districts. Yeah. Mm. Health districts are charged with health. There we go. Uh, and they contract with people to do the promotion of health within schools. So it's entirely possible. And I think uh, we agree that it's most likely 
that school boards don't even know what's going on right. in these particular circumstances, or at least in many circumstances. I might make exceptions for maybe the city of Boise, <laughs> um, but school districts may not even, and school boards may not even know what's going on because the stuff is like under the jurisdiction of health and welfare. Got it. So I don't think, you know, we want to hold the, you know, the State Board of Education, you know, like directly responsible because people are just naive to the way in which federal grants end up operating in the school districts. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Anna. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And the only thing I'll add is that it's entirely possible that, you know, the directors of our Department of Health and Welfare, the people at the highest levels, um, aren't aware of the intent behind these programs. Because, you know, even when ETR sells the reducing the risk curriculum, they themselves call it pregnancy prevention and abstinence. Mm -hmm. um, the government grant, it talks about pregnancy prevention and preventing STDs and things. And if you actually go to the Department of Health and Welfare website, it explains the program according to those lines. So it's totally possible that even the people at the highest levels that at first maybe thought it was a good idea to accept this federal grant aren't aware of how the system is being corrupted. And this really should just um, bring attention to how, how often interest groups come in to the situation yeah. where states are accepting federal grants yeah. and start corrupting the system. They claim to offer one thing and they deliver something completely different. They claim to offer abstinence and they deliver LGBTQ curriculum. They deliver mm. Okay, so simply because, like I said before, the Department of Health and Welfare has been working with this group for so long and maybe they realized how radical they were or maybe they didn't. Um, these local entities, these regional agencies are starting to adopt their radical goals like porn literacy. They're offering this training apparently to their trainers according to their website. Um, so it, it's totally possible that people at the high levels are not there, but someone within this bureaucratic system is aware and made these decisions mm. and started making these resources available to teachers. And like Vanderbilt, follow the money. Yeah, yeah, for real. Follow the money. Follow the money. You know, this is just. Yeah. I, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for doing this kind of yeah, research. Yeah, great thank work. you guys for doing this work. You know, this is part of the fourth estate. We wouldn't have known if you guys wouldn't have actually done That's the research right. to um, find this stuff out and to let us know. So first, thank you for that. Is there a website that people can go to to keep track of your work so that we can stay up to date of what's happening here in Idaho? Yeah, a great place to go is centerforamericaneducation.org. That's the research center that I head up at Idaho Freedom Foundation. Um, that will have any updates regarding this story. And we also, you know, track the ideological movements across our whole state and every single school district on a new map that we launched. So check it out. And oh, my wow. baby apparently is very excited about it too. Just saying, hey, man. <laughs> We're just saying, hey, man. Scott, what about you? Well, I mean, uh, you know, Anna and I co-author this stuff. And uh, so we post them usually on Idaho Freedom Foundation. We also have written, you know, a few things nationally uh on the american mind.org uh we wrote about yeah. uh, libraries in idaho and uh and we recently had something on the federalist but uh i'm just you know i'm just a simple country boy helping anna out with this uh <laughs> with this um with this research and we posted on anna's outfit Mm. Scott's Batman. Yeah, I know. you know he's he's, 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 he's posing as Bruce yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you guys stay right there. <laughs> he knows it. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have you some kids. And if you have kids, go baptize them. Until tomorrow, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is cross politics. Go find out what they're teaching your kids. <laughs> and pull them out of government schools. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Call the cops on local health districts. <laughs> yeah. It is the duty of the free man to resist tyranny at every turn. Every man will either watch his freedom stripped away or take action to protect what he loves. Introducing the A3, the newest revolutionary body armor from Armored Republic. The A3 is the new standard for lightweight multi-hit body armor. A3 plates are incredibly light at 4.6 pounds. The patented design captures fragmentation while remaining multi-hit capable. The A3 will stop up to M80 ball, yet comes in at only 0.7 inches thick. The A3 is the thinnest NIJ.06 compliant or certified composite standalone plate that includes the drop test. The A3 is the first of its kind, patent pending, that combines an alloy strike face with polyethylene backing, revolutionizing body armor technology by providing strength and durability while remaining sleek and maneuverable. The A3 is the new standard in lightweight body armor. 
The fight against tyranny just got stronger. Meet Big Ed. He has a tax-funded taste for children. Big Ed knows that the best grooming starts early. He has a plan for your preschoolers, a plan to gender confuse your grade schoolers. But if you think his grooming stops there, you have not been paying attention. Big Ed wants to liberate your daughters from old-fashioned ideas like, well, you already know. Big Ed has dorm rooms ready for you in prison buildings of learning and professors standing by dedicated to grooming young adults in doubt and unbelief. After all, he is the gatekeeper of this brave new world. And if you want a job, you'll need to pay him with years of your life for a permission slip. Yeah, whatever. You think David paid Goliath for a certificate in giant management before those two squared off? Did Luther major in theses? Was George Washington summa cum laude in empire repellents, while Jefferson focused on ag with a minor in declarations? When the world needs saving, meaningful vocations abound for those who are truly prepared. And the truth is, despite Marxist advances, this is still America and Big Ed is still a voluntary opt-in. So don't, not at any level, not preschool, not middle school, not college. It isn't complicated. When Big Ed offers you free candy, stay away. You'll thank us later. We know it's crazy, but run with us here. Men and women were created in the image of God. You don't need a government certificate of faux learning for personal validation or permission to work. You were born with divine permission to pursue knowledge and understanding, truth, goodness, and beauty. And at New St. Andrews College, we are committed to helping students do just that to their fullest potential. In an age dominated by chaos when learning is on a choke leash controlled by Big Ed and his many strange friends, ours is an education for outlaws, an education for men and women committed to building a beautiful and free society in the ruins of the Western world. When thinking is outlawed, only outlaws will think. Yes, Big Ed hates what we do, but his hatred brings us joy. New St. Andrews College, liberal arts for outlaws, mind, body, and soul.